what I want to say though is that in this sort of encounter, or in, the, in the coming of these sorts of borders um, to the Indian Ocean world, um, while there were really effective responses that were beginning to happen, right? I mean, um, like the polemical tradition and so, and also military expeditions, like the, <coughs> what um, Giancarlo was telling us about, there were these people who kind of fell through the cracks. And what this last episode I want to talk to you about uh, on freedom is about one of these people who fell through the cracks. Um, so it, what's interesting about it is that if you, so it, this, uh, what we know about this guy comes from um, two inquisitorial interrogations. Um, the first, the, and I'm going to tell you the story in the way that it comes out from the inquisitorial record, because it's important to realize what kind of a source this is. So this is not a kind of easy way to get the life of a person, because there's clearly, you know, sort of violence being enacted on this person to give evidence in certain ways that they're looking for, and you have to kind of piece together what actually you can from his life through that lens of violence, right? Um, so the first uh, record, um, it begins on March 11th, so the first uh, interrogation begins on March 11th, and it took place in Shaul, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this city. Um, at the time of this interrogation, Gabriel was roughly 40 years of age. Before his baptism, some 12 or 13 years before in the same city in Shaul, in a church whose name he had forgotten, so he didn't remember the name of the church where he was baptized, um, he had been known in Moorish as Remy, R-E-M-E. Right? Um, he had been taken from his Abyssinian homeland, so it turns out that he's Habshi or um, Ethiopian, um, and was eventually sold to a Muslim in Shaul um, called Mullah Mahmud. Uh, Asked how he came to be a um, Christian, Gabriel reported that he had escaped from his master with another girl, and the two had converted to Christianity together in the city, um, although they had never married. When asked why he then fled from Shaul um, for the land of the Moors, so this is actually why he was hauled out by the Inquisition, because he had converted to Christianity, and then he had run away again to Muslim territories far from Shaul. Um, and uh, and so they asked him like, why he had gone to the land of the Moors. He replied that in Shaul, another Christian Abyssinian, so a Christian Ethiopian, um, whose name he, had, he did not know in Christianity, but was named in the Moorish tongue as Sidi, um, did not want him to marry the girl uh, Gabriel had rescued from Balagha, um, but instead had wished him to sell the girl and marry a more honorable woman. So, so the reason he ran away is because somebody was trying to force him to marry against his will and to sell off, I mean, I think there's a love affair too that's happening in the story. So, so he, he escaped with this woman and we, we'll learn more about, how, about the circumstances of this affair. Um, since Gabriel objected to the marriage, he went at once again to the land of the sultans. Um, he objected to the idea that he had returned to Muslim customs there that, um, and he says, this is interesting, he said that he, he, had, he had already come circumcised to India from his homeland. And when asked how long he had been a Muslim, he replied that he was only Muslim to the extent that he visited mosques and that he performed prayers in the, in, in the company of people. So he's, he's like, he doesn't really care <laughs> when he's with what seems to be the issue here, right? Um, when asked what happened to the girl that would come to Balaga, he replied that she had actually stayed with her master and child. So it turns out that this Christian Abyssinian was his master. So what had happened is that he had been converted, and then the fathers who had converted him then gave him as a slave to a Christian, Habshi, because Christians could own slaves in Portuguese. Blah, blah, blah. And that was why he actually ran away from another master. So he, so, 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 so the, the story is really complex, so you have to kind of leave aside lenses of identity, of nationality, if you're gonna to try to understand what happens to this man. Um, and then, this, is, this, this part is what really gets interesting. Then he says that, um, uh, <clears throat> then he says, this is, this is a weird part of the story. He says that actually he was in um, the Muslim land, so he's been there for many years, but then he remembered he had come to remember he was Christian and wished to convert, right? Mm -hmm. I said, like, what? At that moment, he says, 
he met a barber who was a disciple of a Sufi um, order. So he says, Un barbero de Kojegi, so Kwajaji, right? So it's, it's a Sufi barber um, who asked him why he, why he wished to go to the Christians. And he told Gabriel that if he came with him, he would clothe him and make him the Muslim he was. And Gabriel had claimed to the inquisitors that he had responded to the barber that he wished to come back to Shaul. And leaving the barber, he was discovered by a Portuguese soldier who was, escaped, who was chasing an escaped slave. Um, who had then captured Gabriel and brought him back to show. So then in the next session, so, as, so he tells the story in the first interrogation. In the next session, the story changes and changes in a really interesting way. So clearly some kind of violence happened between <laughs> session one and session two that we don't know about. But Charles Delon does talk about the kind of violence that happened before each of these sessions. So then he comes back chastened to the inquisitors and is ready to give them the story that they want to hear. Um, so he now spoke animatedly and with clarity. This is what, so the inquisitors are happy. The process is working. And he gave his age as 40. Um, and this is where he, we learn more about the circumstances of the conversion originally and that the Dominican fathers had given him to a Christian um, uh, Abyssinian as a slave after conversion. So conversion didn't lead to freedom at all. Like, so he, he, just, he just went straight back to slavery. But what's interesting is that actually, when he had come to Shaul, he was already freed. So his original Muslim owner had freed him, but he had run away because the, the girl was still a slave. So he, so he, he didn't have to run away because he was already freed in the Muslim land. The reason he ran is because of the girl. Um, so he come to Shaul to convert so that they could both be free, except that they both ended up slaves. Um, so uh, this, this time, I mean, he, he sort of confesses to everything that the inquisitors do. He says, I, I do the namaz, and, like, and the inquisitors like, have a field day talking about all these Muslim practices that they know about. And I'm thinking that they probably know more than he does, right? <laughs> because then they're using these sort of terms in Portuguese to talk about all these practices. Um, but we get a little bit more about his early life. So one of the things that we find out, for example, is that he had been born to Jewish parents. Um, so he was an Ethiopian Jew, but he, was, um, he had been captured at a young age by Christians, by Ethiopian Christians, um, who sold him in a coastal town in Arabia to a Muslim, uh, whose name he did not know, and then who then sold him to another Arab Muslim um, merchant, who brought him first to Shaul and then sold him to his master who he was living with in Balakab. Um, so if we look past the inquisitorial concerns of, you know, conversion, of, you know, these, all these boundaries of religions, Gabriel's <clears throat> life is better understood not in terms of identity, because you can't, this story is so complicated, <laughs> right? I mean, you can't actually make, a, make sense of this life if you think in terms of identity, whether it's the fact that he's Ethiopian, the fact that he's you know, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, it doesn't help. You can't actually make sense of his life. Um, but um, it, one of the ways that you know, I started to kind of think about, well, how do I make sense of this bizarre life, right? Um, is to actually think about the places and what we can re sort of, um, sort of figure out about him without actually looking at this inquisitorial record. Like what Giancarlo was talking about, like sort of give more information of context to actually make sense of this. So one of the things that, so he's an Ethiopian slave, and um, for, it's the trade in Ethiopian slaves to India uh, has really, really bad <coughs> roots. Um, and it's also partly because the Fatah and Nagas, uh, the, um, the Ethiopian law of kings, allows for slave raiding of um, uh, prisoners of war and also unbeliever, unbeliever. So Ethiopian slave raiders would catch these um, people and then they were being traded all the way to India um, and there seems to be evidence like from almost the first century AD. So this is a very long slave trade. Um, and you know, the, there are records of this on Gujarati and uh, various Indian languages. Um, and what, what would happen to them, in India they were referred to as habshis or siddhis, a corruption of Sayyid, um, which came to have negative connotations as a result, which is really weird, <laughs> um, or kafirs. Um, and these slaves were usually converted to Islam, either in Arabia or India or even at sea. 
um, with a name change, which actually makes it really hard to trace their lives um, because you don't know what, the, what their names were. Um, but conversion to Islam also kind of allowed them a way to melt into local society. So this really weird story he tells about the Sufi barber um, shows that there was a way in which, you know, you could, the fact that he was Muslim like allowed him certain types of access to Indian society. Um, Habshi's slaves were um, sort of prized and the subcontinent as soldiers. So even Batuta himself had declared that they were the guarantors of safety on the Indian Ocean. Let there be but one of them on a ship and it will be avoided by the Indian pirates and idolaters. Um, Indeed, unlike the stereotypical image of the black chattel slave in the Atlantic world, the Hapshi was associated, despite slave status, with military prowess and even sovereign rule across the subcontinent. So, and it's, it's not an unfounded image. In Bengal, for example, the community of slaves at court became so powerful that the commander of the palace guard, uh, Sultan Shahzada, um, assassinated Jalaluddin Fat and assumed the throne in 1486. So you have this long tradition of Hapshi rule in India, um, and, uh, and especially in the Deccan, the area that he was in, there was a very long tradition of Hapshi. So, so some, some, some interesting depictions of this image in India of the Hapshi, these slaves, associated with royalty. Um, and so this is a, um, uh, let me, I forget exactly who this artist is, but this is a fascinating Mughal painting showing an Indian prince in the land of the Jangus. Of, of the Ethiopians. Um, and then you can see this imagery of royalty and slavery. So this, was, uh, this, is, uh, this is Malik Ambar, who was um, essentially ruler of the Nizam Shahi, which was, um, which, was the, which was the sultanate actually that owned Shaul, the city that he was in before the Portuguese. Um, and so um, Malik Ambar was a region, but he was, he was basically a slave who, who ruled. Uh, the Nizami Sultanate. What's awesome is that this image was painted by a Deccan uh, artist, a Hashim, but this one is actually painted by a Dutchman. Mm -hmm. And you can see that actually the, the style and the, the conversation that's happening in terms of art is, is you know, the, this is a European painting that's actually mimicking um, miniature styles and, and vice versa. So miniature artists in the Deccan were learning from European artists as well. Um, this is a very different image of Malik Amber. So this is a century later, and you can see how now it's beginning to look more like a cartoon. Um, this is a Dutchman, um, and he, you know, he calls him a, a miserable slave, <laughs> but who's also the protector of the kingdom of the Deccan, right? So, so there's, a, there's a very different image that's beginning to um, emerge uh, from the European art. Um, this is, so what's, what's fascinating is that um, the tradition of Hapshi power continued even after the fall of the Deccan Sultanate. Um, so the remarkable island fort of Janjira off the western coast, which the Hapshi captains claimed as sovereign territory in the early 16th century, remained in city hands for well over 200 years. Um, so this this is an image of the of the royal um, uh, of the of the king essentially um, in in uh, 1930. And these are uh, ethnically Ethiopian. Well, that's the thing. I mean, so now there's this, there's this big interest in Afro-Asians. Um, and there are Afro-Asians all over um, in, 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 in um, Sri Lanka and India and Iran. Um, and these are big because uh, the Hapshis would then marry local women. Um, but yeah, I mean, in India, legally, it's a very interesting question. So the Siddhis are classified legally as a tribe which gives them certain types of protection, but there are other Afro-Asian communities that are very marginalized all the way down the coast and they are not afforded the same kinds of protections. So it's, it's a very interesting question of what they are. But that's kind of the story I'm trying to say is that maybe that we should stop caring about these kinds of identity games and try to look at it in a different way. Um, the, but what is interesting is that if you look at this image of Habshi royalty, right? As Gabriel's story indicates, there's actually another history of Habshi slavery in India, right? Um, and there were other experiences of African slavery in the subcontinent. So even if his long stay with the first Muslim master and his eventual manumission 
suggest that this slavery may have been less harsh than the Portuguese variant he later experienced. I mean, he ran away in two months from the Christian slave owner, um, whereas in the Deccan he had stayed for many, many years. Um, his poverty, which made marriage impossible, he says this, and his desire to escape with the still enslaved slave girl suggests that whatever it was, there were still certain forms of sexual unfreedom that his status um, entailed. Um, and what Gabriel kept trying to do was he kept seeking, he kept trying to escape, not, f not to find freedom in the European Enlightenment sense. I mean, I, I totally agree with Wynne Campbell here that, you know, that this is a... Uh, has there ever really been freedom? And maybe that's not the right way to think about it at all. Um, uh, as, as a kind of autonomous, self-directed individual agency, but rather a state of complete detachment from specific cultural webs of dependency. I mean, that's how slavery is experienced, right, from his story. Um, where he ran to is also interesting, because it was a kind of hybrid zone of sovereignty. So Shaul was... Um, uh, had been a coastal town of kind of limited import uh, as a port of trade routes into the northwestern Deccan under the Bahmani Sultanate, and then following the establishment of the Sultanate in Ambandagar, so that was the that was the Sultanate that Malik Ambar eventually came to rule. Um, Shal rose in importance as the main port for that state, and its uh, only entry into the Indian Ocean. <coughs> After the Portuguese counterattack of 1509 in revenge of the successful rout of Portuguese forces in 1508. Um, and this was actually combined forces of Gujarati, Mamluk, and, um, um, and Zamorin. I mean, all these people came together to fight the Portuguese. Uh, and then the Portuguese then counterattack in 1509, um, and they, they basically end up forcing the Nizam Shahi to sign a peace treaty. Um, and they built a factory in 1516, and then um, eventually they build a fort. In 1521. Um, and so Shaul kind of reaches its peak as a port town during this period of peace between the Nizam Shahi and, uh, and the Portuguese. Um, and, um, and Gabriel's life is at the tail end of this because this, this peace sort of, this detente starts to fall apart. Um, it declines, its fortunes decline throughout the 17th century, and, and Surat becomes much more important as a Mughal port town. Um, and, uh, and it's also partly because the Portuguese are also in decline in the 17th century. It's when Gabriel runs to Shaul, Shaul is actually at its height. Um, so Shaul could serve both as Gabriel's port of entry into a network of slavery subtended by Muslim actors that reach deep into the subcontinent, and also as an exit point into a Portuguese sovereignty and Catholic civility, right? So it's both these things. Um, Yet the sponsors of his conversion again enmeshed him in a new web of defenses, dependency, handing him and his female companion over to the charge of a Christian slave owner, an Abyssinian. Um, and he had then sought escape by going back to the Muslim lands, the Teh de Um The only reason we know more about his life is that he gets into trouble again. So, <laughs> so there's a second inquisitorial process. Um, and this time what had happened is, so, so after this first um, interrogation, they um, basically send him back to, they, they, you know, they, they, they give him his punishment, whatever, and then he's handed over to, a college of, to the College of St. Thomas in Goa, um, to basically these clergymen um, in, in Goa, where he's again a slave. And two months after he gets there, he runs away again. But again, he's caught. And now we have another inquisitorial record that tells us about what happened there. So the second one is really interesting because this time um, he has, uh, there are witnesses who talk about him. And the witnesses tell us a lot about the world of slavery within this college. Um, so what happens is that, um, so on August 15, 1595, he was tried in Goa. The first witness against him was the slave joint of the Kurumbi caste which traditionally comprised farmers and laborers in the Kumpen coast, um, who served the purchase of, of the fathers in the college. Uh, he seems to have been of about 16 years of age, according to the Inquisitors, um, and he testified that he had known Gabriel for some four months. In that time, he had heard him say several times that he neither knew nor cared to learn of the Christian doctrine, mm -hmm. that he had fled to the land of the Moors, 
and that had been enough for him to be for him to be Christian one month and Muslim the next. <laughs> um, he also testified, having observed Gabriel perform gestures he had never seen among Christians. This is what he says. Um, kneeling and raising his hands to the sky, though he could not hear or understand the words Gabriel muttered through his teeth. When he asked him what he was doing, Gabriel responded the ceremonies were Muslim. Eventually, Gabriel fled from the college. Then they call up two other witnesses who basically give like suspiciously identical testimony, right? But, the, but who they are is interesting. The second is um, a 20-year-old called Juan Franco, who's a Javanese painter um, in the same college. His particular position is also interesting um, in the spectrum of um, freedom. So he's referred to as Fofu, which would basically mean that he was a freed slave, but he seems to still be a kind of servant in the college, right? Um, and he, that he gives pretty much the exact same testimony. The last witness is the most interesting in some ways. He's a Gujarati 13-year-old called Domingos, and he's identified as Ladino Fofu. Right? Um, which sort of indicates, again, this kind of ambiguous status of freed slave, but still a kind of servant in the college, um, but also his fluency with Portuguese custom and language. Right? Um, and he, uh, he basically says um, that he had, he had been the one who told the fathers on Gabriel. <laughs> so <laughs> he, he had basically um, ratted Gabriel out. Uh, and, uh, and in his own testimony, Gabriel says something very different. He speaks for an interpreter, and he said that he committed no fault except to flee because of the mistreatment of the fathers. Um, further, in fleeing, he had hoped to find this. This really almost broke my heart when I was reading this. He had hoped to find some Ethiopian in the city to ask him for some remedy for his life. Right? Um, this plaintive cry was soon sort of buried under the litany of confessions as elicited by the interrogators who received confirmations of their suspicions of apostasy because that's what they were looking for. This time, Gabriel was sentenced to the galleys and sank sort of unnoticed into the sea of time, and we don't know what happened to him. Um, Gabriel had to contend not with one, but two forms of slavery in the Portuguese um, territory. The northern province where Shaole had a system of slavery that was kind of like a homestead type. So basically, you would, you would, um, people would have two to three domestic slaves, um, in, in which Portuguese and Christian black owners held at most like two or three slaves. That's about the, that's about the average. Um, and so because it was relatively modest, it was actually a kind of um, intimacy that you could have. And so the, the kind of conversation that he has with his Christian Abyssinian owner suggests that there was actually, like, I mean, this guy was trying to get him to marry and do certain things and marry an honorable woman. So there, there was a clear intimacy that existed between slave owners and slaves in Shao. In Goa, however, it's a very different form of slavery. And it's partly to do with numbers. Um, Goa would be emerged as a major hub of slave trading in which the average number of slaves, um, so the Dutchman Linskoven, um, uh estimated an average of between 12 and 13 slaves, uh, 30 slaves per owner in the scenario. Um, moreover, institutions like convents and seminaries um, congregated huge numbers of slaves. So the convent of Santa Monica rate of, like, complained once that their 120 slaves were insufficient. Um, and what they said was even more interesting. They argued that even single individuals in Goa could have, quote, 15 or 20 female slaves or 26 women and girls, while uh, Juiz Ordinario or Desembargador held 85 female slaves and some rich ladies over 300. Um, so it's not the same sort of plantation complex slavery that you see in the Atlantic world, but the sheer numbers means that it's a very different social world. And you can see this in the testimony of Gabriel. Like, I mean, you know, you have a Javanese guy, you have a Gujarati guy, you have this uh, Konkan, and they're different, you know. And he's clearly not sharing anything with these guys. I mean, he's, he's, there's, no social, there's no social cohesion among the slaves here. Um, so, it, although it did bring together people from all over the Indian Ocean, this is not cosmopolitan. This is not the coffee house of syrup. Um, 
not certain, definitely not in the kind of elite traditions of European Enlightenment thought, but also not in a kind of marginal or vernacular sense, um, because you can see this huge gulf between Gabriel and Domingos, right? Um, the former was alienated from his fellow slave in the Goan language, uh, in the Goan college, by dint of a lifetime spent in servitude in the Deccan. So he knew one culture of slavery. Um, and, and the latter, Domingos, familiarity with Portuguese customs meant that he, he was considered a, you know, a insider, a, an outsider with insider social status almost, right? Um, so, so the shared status doesn't mean, and even their shared coexistence as bodies in the college did not mean that they existed in a space of shared meaning, which is minimal to even the most broad definitions of cosmopolitanism, right? That we sort of live, we, we share meaning, right? So what, what I want to say is that um, while Gabriel had enjoyed years of enslavement in the Deccan, when he'd been, you know, without sort of speculating on the relative severity of Portuguese versus um, subcontinental modes of slavery, it is indubitable that his alienation from the system of enslavement in which Domingos was able to live, right, um, was profound. Gabriel's final escape in the hope of finding another Abyssinian who could provide a remedy for his life suggests an endless search for a network, for, for being, for just to be, right? I mean, he's not interested in all these sort of fenced-in modes of being. Um, and as a historian, I mean, you have to basically be honest and say that in the final analysis, it's really hard to assign clear intention in Gabriel's wanderings across the western coast of India. Um, the essential indeterminacy of his path is for us most clear in the strange encounter with the Sufi barber that he relates in the first Inquisition. Um, what was Gabriel on his way to his master, referring to his previous owner whom he had fled out of a longing for the slave girl he had left behind? Or did Gabriel's interpreter, because remember all of this Inquisition stuff is happening through an interpreter, put a kind of Catholic gloss on a totally different concept, which was um, that if one consist, considers the long tradition of slavery, bandagi, as a spiritual metaphor in Sufi thought, then it starts to look as if maybe he had gone to the Sufi barber to be a slave in the spiritual sense, right? But we can't know. It's really, really hard to say clearly that, you know, what his intentions were. And this is not simply because the inquisitorial process itself engendered dissimulation, false confections, but it's because Gabriel's trajectory violates at every turn the boundaries of identity um, through which we traditionally discern intention in historical actors. Um, being Abyssinian, he both ran from and sought out his countrymen. Being Muslim, he sought out Christianity only to return to, to abandon it for Islam. Being free, if we believe his testimony, he sought to return to slavery, only to seek freedom again. In the face of these wander lines, the historian can discern only that they're magnetized by an intense desire not to be fenced in to a system, right? Um, so if we see in Gabriel's life a kind of paradigmatic experience that encompasses the complex spatial, political, and religious worlds of the Early modern imperial, uh, uh, early modern Indian Ocean, the frameworks of cosmopolitanism, of diaspora, of empire, are inadequate. Um, so I'm not saying that th these are not important ways of looking at it, but I'm saying that um, that there were all of these systematic projects in this Indian Ocean that was undergirded by violence and enforced through the imposition of strict boundaries, both spatial, such as borders and licensed pathways like the Portuguese and Iraq, and social, in the sense of consciously articulated and policed structures of identity, right? Whether it's Catholic or whether it's Hadrami. Um, okay, I'll just wrap up. Um, but I'm suggesting that beneath these circuits of power, there was this there were other ways of being in the Indian Ocean. And that is also something that maybe we should think about, and not just focus on these um, thought out projects and look at lives like Gabriel in this way. Um, I want to end by showing you a couple of things about you know, 
what history of the Indian Ocean could look like and why, we, why, it's in, why it's such a productive time to rethink the Indian Ocean. So this is a painting of the famous meeting of Vasco da Gama um, uh, with the Zamorin and Calicut. Um, this is what the, the uh, uh, Sheikh actually says, is, you know, he, he sort of comes in as an interloper, right? Except uh, this guy, José Veloso Salgado, paints this in a totally different way. Like, this is this triumphal meeting, and, you know, he's showing him all these grand gifts that he's bought him and all of this stuff. And it, the painting is actually in a really interesting place in Lisbon. It's in the Geographical Society, which has one of the most important collections of African art. And it's like this bizarre place, like this kind of warehouse of the Portuguese empire. It's really, really creepy. Um, and, <laughs> and then this, um, this is a recent uh, installation piece um, by this um, Indian artist, Bushmala. Um, it was shown at the Kochi Biennale um, um, last year. And sh that's her dressed as Vashko de Gama, like so holding them you know, with the beard and everything. And she had photographs up of like the process of becoming and like recreating this scene. And so it's, it seems to be an identical, you know, replica of that colonial painting. But obviously this has totally different meanings now. Um, because it's an, you know, it's all enacted by Indians, both the Portuguese side and the other, and the, and the Indian side, right? And there was also with this this really fascinating blackboard, and I think it's important that it was a blackboard um, where it sort of gives us these facts like Vasco da Gama employed the Indian navigator Kanha, um, Europeans relied on, you know, and they were ignorant. The Kerala School of Mathematics and Astronomy in Cochin had created the most accurate calendar and trigonometric calculations needed for calcul navigation in the 15th century. I mean, if anybody's been following like sort of right-wing Hindu um, nationalist narratives of history, I mean, this, this is it, right? I mean, it's like we taught them how to even colonize us, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> so this is totally nationalist uh, interpretation of this imperial past. But what I think that this recreation suggests, and I think it's really interesting, is that the imperial past looks a lot like the national present. And that you know that everybody is still being policed and by these kinds of borders, and that and they are deeply, deeply oppressive. And the, and you can see this in a way in the story that I sent you an excerpt of this brilliant, brilliant novel, and I encourage everybody to read it called Goat Days. And the story of this novel is interesting too. So it's written in Malayali by a Keralite author who lives in um, Abu Dhabi, I think. Um, so he writes it in Malayali in the, in the Gulf. It then wins the following year the Kerala Sahitya Academy Award. This is the first time a diasporic author wins the Kerala <laughs> Sahitya Award. Um, it was then translated into English, so it's available. It was also then translated into Arabic, and it was available at last year's um, literature festival, but now it's been banned by Bahrain, um, Saudi Arabia. So it's, it's banned, but it's the story of, and it's based on a true story that Benjamin met this person who went to the Gulf, like many of these Carolite um, immigrants, to work in the Gulf, but he essentially becomes a slave. And he's, he's forced to live with these goats, and the whole story is about how he slowly starts to become a goat. <laughs> it's, a, it's a brilliant novel, uh, and you know, the, the, this quote kind of tells you a little bit about that process of like, literally losing all his personhood. Um, and, and you can actually, it's really interesting is that if you read sort of Human Rights Watch reports on, um, on um, the ways in which um, migrant workers are treated in the Gulf, the novel is not a novel. I mean, it's, it's fact, it's true. So you, these are testimony that Human Rights Watch collected from domestic workers of how they were treated and they were always called animals. And in the novel, <laughs> Then you mean also, I mean, the, the, the slave essentially is also called an animal. So he literally becomes a goat in this world of the Indian Ocean, which is, you know, cosmopolitan and all of the good stuff, but it's also this, this really, really ugly world. Um, but what's amazing is that the novel ends like this. So essentially what happens is that he manages to escape the slave owner and he basically has to struggle to get himself deported. Um, and so eventually, the, so he's in this prison and they basically have these like terrible um, 
um, and again, this is actually documented by Human Rights Watch. So basically, the prisoners are brought out, and Arab owners who are you know, looking for their escaped workers will walk up and down to see if one of them are there, and if they catch them, then they take them away. Um, and, uh, and the next day, the embassy officials come with the exit passes, and those who make it are then you know, deported, and they go back. But if we, the novel ends like this. The embassy officials distributed the boarding passes. Together, we were made to walk towards the plane. I could not help thinking of how the site was so similar to herding a flock of goats back into Masara, the goat pen. I was one of the goats. Mine was a goat's life. So the nation and the Indian Ocean, it's, it, it's all borders turn people into goats. Um, and it's not, it doesn't matter if it's imperial or national. So I just want to leave you with that thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs>